hopefully uh, you can see the satire there and the, the irony of, of all that as uh, we dive into this morning, uh, as we take a look at our theme of being a servant and taking a look at the beautiful picture that it is to be a biblical servant. And uh, uh, all too much do sometimes we get wrapped into the image that being a servant is. Uh, we often proclaim being a servant and we desire to be a servant, but sometimes when we search our hearts, uh, these type of motives come to the surface. So as we take a look at what it means to be a servant this morning, let's search our hearts and our minds to rid ourselves of what idolatry might exist in our motivations and in our inward beings as to being servants. So if you want to go to Mark chapter 10, that's where we're going to start this morning. We're all going to also take a look at a passage from Philippians chapter 2. Uh, but our springboard here this morning is Mark uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 32 through 45. And so, as we take a look at what it is to be a servant, I want to begin by asking this question, how would you define a servant? What is your picture of a servant? What does that look like to you? And then even maybe more important is, do you fit that picture? Do you fit that definition that you have in your mind? Or not? Now, you've got to be honest with yourself in a lot of ways when you look and have that self-reflection. But you know, do you see yourself fitting the definition that you have for servant? And then as we go through our passage this morning and through our study, I, I challenge all of us to really think about does, does our definition or picture of what it is to be a servant match what the Bible teaches us about being a servant, what Jesus teaches us about being a servant. So before we dive in, let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us this morning. Father, we give you thanks and praise that we have the opportunity to be here together to open your word, to study, and to learn. Father, help us to know these truths. Help us to apply them so that we might be better equipped and that we might be more like Christ. So be with us, we ask, and it's in Jesus' awesome and precious name we pray. Amen. Mark chapter 10 here, starting with verse 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them that he was what was going to happen to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know what those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, may the Lord bless the hearing and reading of his word this morning. 
Our text here begins with Jesus telling his disciples that he is going to be going to Jerusalem and that he'll be handed over and be put to death and after three days he will raise from the dead. Now this is actually the third time that Jesus has told his disciples this. And this time in Mark's narrative here, they're actually on their way up to Jerusalem when he tells them for the third time. Now, with the previous two times, the disciples' response is quite disappointing. The first time, Jesus has to tell Peter to get behind and tell Satan to get out of the way, to stop following Satan. Because Jesus tells him that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to be handed over and die. And Peter's like, no, 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 you're the Messiah. You're the king. You're the conqueror. You're going you're gonna, to like blow Rome out of here. You're going to be the ruler. You're not going to die. And Jesus has to have some very pointed and stern words for Peter. Well, the next time, Jesus tells them, on the second time, he tells them this. And at that time, Jesus is ahead of them. And the disciples are behind Jesus and they're all huddled together. At least that's the picture that we get. They're all huddled together and they start talking about or arguing about which one of them is the greatest among them. You know, in other words, you know, who, who of us is, is going to be better? Who's going to get those positions of power and honor? And then finally, on this third time that Jesus says this, the disciples, two of them finally get bold enough and going, you know what, we think we're the greatest. So they kind of run up to Jesus and go to Jesus, hey, we want you to do for us whatever it is that, you, that we ask of you. And Jesus kind of like, well, what is it that you want? We want those high positions. We want to be on your side, on the left and the right. We want to be like the most powerful people in your kingdom just below you. You know, you're the king, but we, we want to be, you know, the people closest to you. We want those positions of honor and greatness. So instead of discussing it with the other ten, these two decide to jump on the opportunity of what happened last time to try to get Jesus to give them those positions of honor and greatness. And Jesus then again has to confront them going, what in the world? You don't know what you're asking for. Jesus follows up asking them, do you think you can drink the cup? Do you think you can be baptized with the baptism I have? In other words, Jesus is telling them, are you able to walk the path that I'm going to walk down? Are you able to do what I am going to do? And we can see the naivety, we can see the foolishness, we can see the the blindness that James and and John have here, and they just respond to Jesus, well, sure we can. We can. And then Jesus affirms for them, well, you asked for it, so you're going to get it. You're going you're gonna to drink the cup, and you're going to be baptized the way I'm baptized. You're going to have this baptism, this, this way of life. Well, of course, Like the previous time when they were all arguing about it and Jesus had to tell them that anyone who wants to be first must be last and the servant of all. Jesus has to come to the rest of them who get upset about this. Of course they got upset. And that's just our natures. We we just want to be people who are in those positions that are, are elevated. We, we strive to be the boss. We strive to have those positions of power in our jobs and in society. We, we just, that's where we just want to be. Now, again, we may not necessarily strive, you know, for, you know, those, those very prominent positions like, like president or, you know, congressperson or mayor of a town or, or whatever. But, but we often p- try to position ourselves into places of power. We don't like it necessarily when people tell us what we have to do. We don't necessarily like it when people try to order us around. We don't like it when when people try to, you know, 
exert their power and authority over us. We start to resent the bosses at work who, who look at themselves as the greatest person in the room and you have to bow down and you know, play nice with them. And so we try to position ourselves where we might be favored or be liked. And we position ourselves where we might be people who are actually in that position and be the people that people want to cuddle up with so that they can have more power and greatness. So, of course, when we see other people do this, we get angry. You know, in the, in the work environment, we, we call them, you know, uh, brown nosers or suck-ups and things like that. We, we, we can tend to condemn them and put them down when, when, they're, when we see that they're trying to get favor from the person who is in power. So, of course, the disciples got upset. And so when Jesus sees that they're upset, he finally seems to take a moment to sit them down. And he truly teaches them what it means to have power and to be someone who is at the top, this person who receives glory. He tells them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. In other words, you know what it is to be in power. You see the Roman governors. You see the king King Herod, and how he, when he walks into a room or whenever he's in front of people, people just have to bow down. People have to be quiet. People have to manipulate and, and strive to try to find the king's favor or the governor's favor. You, you see this on display. And he tells them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For not even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus here to his disciples teaches them that greatness comes by serving. Greatness comes by being a slave to everyone. And to be a slave is to be someone who has given up their rights and personal claims and looks to the needs of others. And ultimately, the one who is greatest, who is Jesus himself, he even proclaims that he has not come to be served, but to be that servant. And this comment about being the one who gives up his life as a ransom for many, the ultimate way in which Jesus serves people is by giving up his very life for them. Not just his, his privileges and rights as who for who he is, but he is someone who is actually going to pay a debt on behalf of all people. That is how he will be a servant. He serves by being a ransom ultimately for their salvation. And so Jesus in this text shows us what it is to be a servant. It's not to be someone who is at the top. It's not someone who, is to, to, who has greatness according to the world around them. It's the person who puts themselves at the very bottom. And Jesus also teaches his disciples and us in this moment that you want greatness, you want that position of being on my right and on my left, then you be a servant. You be a slave to all. And that completely goes against everything that our culture has trained us to be. That goes against our nature. It goes against our inherited understanding of how the world works. To put yourself at the bottom. So we see from Jesus as he teaches disciples here this morning. We see what a servant is. Now, if we go to uh, dictionary.com, you know, and look up like a modern definition of what a servant is, a person employed by another, especially to perform domestic duties. That's how dictionary.com defines servant. I find this definition rather interesting because it's a definition that is shaped by our current culture because this definition uses the word employed. 
But biblically, the word servant is actually the same word for slave. And I don't know if it's our modern sensibility or, or what it might be, but oftentimes uh, our biblical translations will put the word servant in there instead of the word slave. Now it's actually quite astounding that when Jesus actually has the word slave that they actually translate it as the word slave in our text. But that is the the mentality that Jesus is teaching his disciples. You are to be a slave of all. No one wants to be a slave, especially in the ancient world. Because a slave in the ancient world is just property. They're owned by a family or a person. They have no rights. They can't do anything. They can't go to the market when they want to go to the market. They can't have free time and do activities that they enjoy when they want to do them. They're not even allowed to own things unless they have permission from their owner to own things. And yet, this is the exact position that Jesus calls his disciples to be in. To be people without rights. To be people who are in this position to be owned by other people. Now, he's not actually saying physically owned as a slave as we understand slavery. Because this idea of slavery also comes with the idea that it is a position in society. It's not just an issue of being owned by someone else. It's a socioeconomic position. And that position in their society is at the complete bottom. There is nothing lower or more detestable than a slave. In the Roman world, slaves were subhuman people. Yes, they recognize that they're human beings, but they're not human beings. They're property to do whatever the the owner says to do. And so Jesus calls his disciples to be in that position. Which is hard. It's incredibly hard to be there because it goes against our nature. It goes against all the training that we've received in our world and in our society. No one wants to be down there. Oftentimes when we come in contact with people who are at the bottom of society, we we tend to avoid them. When we see homeless people on the streets, what is our tendency? Pretend they don't even exist. We pretend they're not there. I know I'm guilty of this. When I'm driving around Kalamazoo, a lot of times I'll see homeless people there with signs and they'll be like, you know, hey, I need money, God bless. And, and what do I do? I stare straight ahead. They're, they're not there. They're not going to come to my window and ask for money. I hope that they stay right there. And if I don't make eye contact, then, then yes, the, they will ignore me just as I am ignoring them. And so I know myself to be guilty in those moments. And oftentimes we come up with excuses, which might be legitimate, like who knows what they're going to go spend that money on. It would be better to go get them a cheeseburger from McDonald's if they're truly hungry than give them money. And those are probably legitimate things. But the question is, what is the heart attitude? What is the inward being speaking? What is it motivated by? And, I, and to my shame, it's sometimes like they don't exist. I'm just driving Hurry up, light, turn green, turn green, I need to go. But yet Jesus is calling us into positions that are at the bottom. At the bottom. Being a servant is rooted in the example of Jesus' obedient self-giving. And Paul lays this out so clearly for us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So if you have your Bible, open it and go to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, 
Because he is God. He did not consider himself equal with God, something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We'll pause right there for a minute. And so we see Jesus here. As, being, as, as Paul is showing us, someone who is in the very nature God. He exists as God. He has all privileges and prerogatives as being God. Yet, he poured himself out. He took the form of what? A servant. In other words, he took himself from the top to the very bottom. And became obedient even to the point of death. On a cross. And in Jewish society, there, there's just nothing worse than being hung on a tree because that is to be cursed by God. So not only by being a servant are you being rejected by society, but you're being crucified to death on a cross or on a tree. So now you're even being rejected by God. And it's because Jesus did this. It's because Jesus, having all rights and privileges as God, giving up those things to become a servant, even to the point of death and a ransom, God did this. Therefore, God exalted him, verse 9, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the very name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In other words, because Jesus did not take advantage of any of his privileges, any of his rights as God, gave those up to become a servant, placing himself at the bottom of society and serving and being a slave to all. God exalted him, giving him the very name Yahweh. And so that all people would confess and bow down to him. And so from what Paul is writing to the Philippians and teaching us here this morning, we learn clearly that greatness comes through humility. Greatness comes through being a servant, being a slave. And so from what Jesus teaches and from what Paul expands on on who Christ is at his very core, a biblical picture of a servant is to position oneself below all others, meeting the needs of people with a posture of humility and welcoming the least in society. That is the biblical picture of a servant. And so going back to the beginning and you thinking through and your definition of being a servant and, and, what a, and your picture in your mind of what being a servant is, is it this? Is it giving up your rights and privileges? Is it not taking advantage of the, the, the privileges that we have as people, giving those things up that we might serve others? Or are we about ourselves? Servants are people who are at the bottom. There is no glamour. There is no honor. There is no status gained. Servants are ugly. In this world, there is nothing to be gained by being a servant. But again, this is the upside-down logic of the cross. Exaltation comes through humiliation. Humiliation. And we often try to shield ourselves from humiliation. Now again, Jesus is not teaching here anything about the idea of go sell all your stuff and go live on the streets and be at the bottom. What he's saying is, in spite of the privileges and things you have, that you set those things aside when it comes to the needs of other people. Ultimately, we see from what Paul writes, there is no glory without the cross. 
And so as we come and ask ourselves, so what here this morning? If a servant is someone who positions oneself below all others, meeting the needs of people with a posture of humility and welcoming the least in society, then being a servant is the pathway to participating in Christ's glory. Being a servant is the pathway of participating in Christ's glory. Jesus teaches that to follow him is to suffer. Jesus teaches that to follow him is utterly humiliating. Jesus teaches that to follow him is the lowest position one can have in society. Ultimately. As he tells James and John, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I have In other words, Jesus is preparing them, telling them, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be humiliated in every way possible. And then I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be put to death on a tree. Which is to be cursed by God. Can you do that? Can you suffer such a humiliation? Can you suffer such a a, a demeaning position? It's not about just the fear of death. It's about all the humiliation and ugliness that comes with it. And James and John in their naivety say, oh yes, yes, we can do that. We can drink from the same cup you drink from. We can walk the same path that you're going to walk in. We can be baptized with the same baptism that you will receive. And as you read the gospel accounts, you see them all cower and run away. What's funny, when you read the gospel accounts, yes, John does seem to be there, but at some point he must walk away from Christ because he's not there I don't believe when Jesus' body comes down off the cross. He's there at the crucifixion, but he's not there when the body comes down. Joseph of Arimathea, and who's the other guy? Nicodemus. A guy who was trying to figure out who Jesus was no longer afraid to be associated with Jesus, is there taking his body down off the cross. And yet his disciples, who knew him best, who were warned, who were told, and even confessed that they could go through what Jesus went through, weren't there to take his body off the cross. The path Jesus walked, God ultimately vindicated And exalted him. And if we walk that path, if we drink from the cup that Jesus drank from, and we are baptized with the same baptism that he received, then we too will be people who are exalted with Christ. But that is just completely upside down to us. We always try to position ourselves to where we want to save face. We don't want to suffer humiliation. We don't want to be seen associated with people who are lowly people. We have an image that we have to maintain. We can't be seen with, with corrupt and sinful people. But Jesus says that is what it is to be a servant. Secondly here, being a servant is being a slave. That is, positioning ourselves at the bottom, giving up all our rights and privileges, just as Christ did, looking to the needs of others. And third, being a servant is having hospitality. When we welcome the marginalized and vulnerable, we welcome Jesus and the Father. Is there really anything better than that? And this actually comes out of the second episode that uh, Jesus has with his disciples, his second conversation when Jesus uh, tells them that he's going to go to Jerusalem to die and then he'll be raised. And they're all talking about who the greatest is. And when 
Jesus finally confronts them and tells them that, you know, the greatest person has to be a servant. He then, at the end of that conversation, gets a child who must be in the room with him. He grabs a child and places the child in front of them and says, whenever you welcome one of these, you welcome me and the Father. And Jesus' point is that being a servant is someone who is welcoming the person who is the lowest in society. Jesus' illustration of the child is not that you have to have a childlike faith or something like that. He's using the child as an illustration to show that this child represents the, the lowly in society. Because children in the ancient world were only people who had potential to be human. They were like servants. They were to be quiet and out of the way of the adults, especially the men, not to be bothered by the children. And so Jesus brings them and says, you know, when you welcome, when you receive, when you say, come to my table, come into my home, when you spend time, when you interact, when you have fellowship with the least in society, we welcome Christ and we welcome the Father. So being a servant is having hospitality. And the motivation for being a servant is not out of obligation or out of the goodness of our hearts. To say that we do it out of the goodness of our hearts really cheapens things. Like it's something that of, our, of ours that we have to have and need to be doing. Rather, it is our honor and our privilege to be servants. It's our honor and it's our privilege. And so we see truly that being a servant then is a very beautiful picture because it's just so incredibly ugly. That's the cross. The cross is utterly disgusting. And that is the image in which Christ embraced. Is that an image that we too, are we willing to embrace it? That we might need, meet the needs of people who are in need. So that's our challenge. As we think about being servants and our theme this month of being servants. May we be biblical servants. Positioning ourselves in places that are just utterly humiliating. Welcoming people that would just, just people would go crazy at welcoming. Because when we welcome them and we serve them, that ugly image in which Christ embraced, we embrace. And as Paul shows us in Philippians, what is it to walk the path of Christ? What is it to drink that cup? What is it to have that baptism as Christ? To be glorified by God. Oh, how beautiful that is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time here this morning. We thank you for the incredible and beautiful picture of what it means to be a servant. Clearly demonstrated in Christ himself. Help us too to be people who Embrace the image that Christ embraced. Putting aside our privileges, our rights, that we would serve others. Help us to engage our imaginations to how we might fulfill this ultimately. Husbands being incredible servants to their wives, wives being incredible servants to their husbands, and and parents being incredible servants to their children. Being servants at work. Instead of manipulating and, and trying to find ways to go up the corporate ladder. That we might have a posture that would just do the work. That we might help others along the way. 
Father, help us to have this mindset, to always be engaged in opportun- and see opportunities where we might be able to serve. We thank you and we praise you for this time this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.